Welcome to my second lecture under module 1 which is on the history and basics of genetic engineering. Here we will discuss a little bit of the historical development of the various scientific events that played a critical role in the development of this discipline as well as some of the important tools that are critical for carrying out genetic engineering work. Let us begin with a discussion on a historical development starting with a traditional biotechnology which is several thousand years old where humanity acquired the art of microbial fermentation. It was simple technique and the cost involved for this kind of biotechnology was quite low. But as you can see the movement through this graph upwards from the transition from traditional biotechnology towards modern biotechnology of the current era, you can see that the cost of the technology going up by several folds and in between you can see the positioning of recombinant DNA technology which we are discussing uh, in this particular module. Missing here is of course the cost positioning of gene editing and genome engineering which we will discuss at a later point of time. Now in this entire developmental journey we are going to focus on the history of recombinant DNA technology and a little bit of the genetic engineering of plants and animals and what are the tools which are required to carry out the same. Let us first begin with a definition of genetic engineering which is rather diverse and it means uh, several things to several people. I have picked up a standard definition offered by the National Human Genome Research Institute which tells that the word genetic engineering or genetic modification is a process that uses laboratory based technologies to alter the DNA makeup of an organism. This may involve changing a single base pair or deleting a region of the DNA or adding a new segment of DNA. Genetic engineering may involve adding a gene from one species to an organism from a different species to produce a desired trait. Having wide applications in research and industry, genetic engineering has been applied to the production of cancer therapies, brewing yeast, genetically modified plants, livestock and many more. We are going to discuss some of the things that are required for changing of single base pairs or deleting or adding a new segment of DNA. This is a brief history of the subject genetic engineering. So, in 1951 Jack Williamson mentioned the term genetic engineering for the first time in his novel Dragon Island. In following year uh, Hersey and Chase confirmed the role of DNA in heredity. In 1952, we had a discussion on this uh, previously. In 1953, Watson and Crick proposed the double helical structure of DNA that is also known to you in last uh, lecture. In 1972, one important development took place. Paul Burke created the first recombinant DNA molecule by combining DNA from the monkey virus SV40 with that of the lambda virus. And the following year, Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen created the first organism, transgenic organism by introducing antibiotic resistant genes into the plasmid of E. coli. In 1974, Rudolf Janis generated genetically engineered mice for the first time in the history of genetics. So, this is in brief the rapid development and as you can see some of the developments took place with a very a narrow span of time starting from 1972 to 1974. So, in a way these rapid developments revolutionized biology in a very different way. So, this is the contribution of Polberg who created the first recombinant DNA molecule combining DNA from monkey virus as we 40 with that of the lambda virus and you can see uh, the photograph of Pol Polberg on the right side. So, we will be discussing some of these methods how the DNA is 
cut and joined uh, in, in the process of genetic engineering. So, this is the paper published in 1973 by 73 by Cohen and his colleagues in uh, PNAS who created the first transgenic organism by introducing antibiotic resistant genes into the plasmid E. coli uh, in 1973. What are the basic steps in genetic engineering or the critical steps in genetic engineering? Although very advanced technique, uh, it has some of the very simple steps in a way. The first step is the identification of a gene of interest. We have to know what is the trait that we want to be expressed in the host organism. So, you need a target gene uh, for this purpose and that target gene has to be identified across species. Once we identify the gene, we need to isolate the gene of interest and then we move on to the cloning and production stage which is the production of identical copies of the target gene. Once we do that, we introduce and integrate that clone DNA into the host genome and finally, the last stage is the expression of the target genome. So, certain steps in plant genetic engineering and animal genetic engineering are little bit different due to the nature of the organisms, but more or less all these five steps are followed in each and every case. In this figure, you can see the transfer of uh, genetic character with the help of a vector to another uh, host organism uh, which is basically a plant cell and we are using agrobacterium plasmid over here. We will discuss this in one of the sections later on. So, let us look into the molecular technique process in a little bit further detail. As I already told you, you need a target gene or a identified gene. So, we have this foreign DNA or foreign gene that we have identified and then we need a carrier. For example, here we are taking a plasmid which we call as a vector into which we load this foreign DNA and then make it hybrid plasmid or a mutated plasmid which carries these targeted gene and then transfer these into the host cells and then we screen the host cells for the mutants. So, for doing this, we need to cut open this plasmid. So, that is being done with the help of restriction enzymes. There are certain things which are going to discuss later when we discuss about the features of a plasmid that it has certain antibiotic resistance genes which helps us in the selection of the mutants. So, the foreign DNA and plasmid are cut with the same restriction enzyme which recognize a particular sequence of DNA called a restriction site. The restriction occurs only once in the plasmid and is located within the lag jet gene as it necessary for metabolizing lactose. We will be discussing the role of this lactose gene, lag jet gene in the uh, expression uh, later on. The restriction enzyme creates sticky ends that allows the foreign DNA and cloning vector to anneal. An enzyme called ligase glues the anneal fragments uh, together. The ligated cloning vector is transformed into a bacterial host strain which is ampicillin sensitive and is missing the leg Z gene from its genome. So, finally, the bacteria is grown on media containing ampicillin and exgol. If there is no any gene transfer or the transfer of the plasmid containing the foreign DNA and which has a ampicillin resistant gene, the bacterial cells will die because they are ampicillin sensitive. Only those bacterial cells will survive into which the plasmid has been transferred successfully. So, this is the basic principle of the molecular cloning and its uh, selection process over here. This we will discuss in later slides as well. Now, let us focus on what are the tools of this technique, genetic engineering. This is basically a kind of a technique which you can tell as 
a molecular carpentry where a lot of cutting and joining work is involved as in the case of making furniture. So, for cutting we require enzymes as well as for modification of the DNA ends or fragments and then we need the vectors as we have seen in the earlier slide for carrying these the targeted gene into the host organism. So, we will discuss about these enzymes a little bit in detail and the first enzymes that are important for this technique is obviously the restriction enzymes which cut open the DNA molecule or uh, the plasmid uh, vectors as well as which helps us in cutting out the desired gene uh, from the uh, uh, species in which it is located. These enzymes cleave DNA into fragments at or near specific recognition sites known as restriction sites. So, it was in 1960 two persons Warner, Arbor and Matthew uh, Metals, Messelson who studied type 1 restriction enzymes for the first time. The first type 2 restriction enzyme hint to was identified and described from the bacteria Haemophilus influenza by Hamilton O. Smith, Thomas Kelly and Kent Wilcox after a decade of these in 1970. In 1978 Warner, Arbor, Daniel Nathans and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for their discovery. Basically what these restriction enzymes does, they fall into two classes, the restriction exonucleases and the restriction endonucleases. The exonucleases catalyzes hydrolysis of terminal nucleotide from the end of DNA or RNA molecule either 5 prime or 3 prime direction or 3 prime to 5 prime direction. You have uh, examples like exonuclease 1, 2, etc. While endonucleases recognizes specific big sequences which we call as restriction sites within DNA or RNA molecule and cleave internal phosphodiester bones within a DNA molecule and examples are ECO R1, HIN3, BAM, H1, etc. The restriction enzymes are found in bacteria and other prokaryotes and confer defense against invading viruses. There are several types, type 1, 2 and 3 and they have uh, different kind of structure. For example, type 1 has 3 different subunits, type 2 has 2 identical subunits, type 3 has 2 different subunits and they require certain cofactors to act and you can see that type 1 requires ATP, MG2+, plus, S, adenosine methionine, type 2 requires MG2+, plus, type 3 requires ATP and MG2+, plus. and the cleavage pattern is different in all of these uh, enzymes. Type 1 the cleavage pattern is random, it is 1000 base pairs away from the restriction site. In type 3 the restriction again is random, but it is not that far away from the restriction site, it is about 24 to 26 base pairs downstream of the recognition site. Type 2 is something very, very interesting where the restriction site and recognition site are located or uh, together or co-located. So, they are at or near the recognition sequence. So, in the case of type 1 enzyme, we do not know, we know the binding site both type 1 and type 3, but we do not know where it is going to cleave. We know the distance at which it is going to cleave but we do not know the sequence at which it is going to cleave. So, they are very, very unspecific digesters or cutters in a way, but in the case of type 2 we know exactly where it is going to bind and exactly where it is going to cut. For genetic engineering we cannot rely on unspecific uh, extraction enzymes like type 1 and type 3 uh, as regards the cutting. We need specific cutting for our work and for this purpose only type 2 enzyme is used for uh, genetic engineering or cloning. Now, let us discuss what are the recognition sites that we are uh, referring to all the time. The restriction enzymes cleave double stranded DNA after recognizing a specific sequence of nucleotides. These specific nucleotide sequences are what we call as 
recognition sites. The number of bases in the recognition sites vary between 4 and 8 and the number of bases in the sequence determines how often the site will appear by chance in any given genome. For example, a 4 base pair sequence would theoretically occur every 4 to the power 4, 6 base pair would occur every 4 to the power 6 and 8 base pair would occur every 4 to the power 8 base pairs. So, a 4 base pair or 4 base pair cutter uh, appears more frequently in the genome than a 8 base pair uh, cutter or uh, sequence. So, if you want only partial digestion of a given genomic DNA, we will use the 8 base pair cutter. And this is very, very important that for mapping we use basically the rare cutter which is the uh, say for example, the 8 base pair cutter we will refer to as a rare cutter because the occurrence of those sequences are uh, comparatively rare in, in comparison to the 4 base pair cutter. Now, this is the recognition site of the typical enzyme ECO R1. You can see over here marked by the red uh, arrows. So, e similarly other enzymes also have their specific recognition sites. Another concept that is important in this regard is the palindromes or palindromic sequences. So, what are DNA palindromes? Palindrome is a word or phrase or sequence that reads the same backward and forward and these are the examples like madam or nurses run. Similarly, malayalam is also a word uh, which reads the same from both the ends. In DNA <coughs> also we have this kind of symmetry, but this symmetry is two-fold rotational symmetry. So, we have to turn the uh, double stranded DNA to get a palindrome. So, that is why we call it as a two-fold rotational symmetry. So, this is a situation in which reading one strand of a double strand DNA or RNA molecule in one direction say 5 prime to 3 prime is identical to reading the complementary strand in the same direction or from the opposite direction. And for example, in the eco R1 restriction nucleus uh, as we have shown in the earlier case, if you can read it G A T T C G A T T C. So, you have to continue the reading from the forward strand to the uh, reverse strand. So, you will get and if you read it from the other side C T T A G C T T A G. So, they will uh, form a double stranded uh, rotational symmetry. Another way to understand is uh, if we write this sequence uh, and carry out some operation. For example, we have a line dividing them in this way and then we rotate this, we rotate this by 180 degree. So, the sequence will become G A A and below it is C T T and if you revert it, it becomes A A G and this will become T T C. So, now whether we read C T T T T C from this side or this side and this sequence from this side or this side, we are going to have two different palindromes in this case. I hope uh, this discussion makes it clear what do you mean by twofold uh, rotational symmetry. This is very important for understanding the recognition and cleavage site of type 2 restriction enzymes. Now, these restriction enzymes when they recognize and cut a particular sequence, they may yield two type of ends one end may be sticky end, the other end may be blunt end and here are some of the examples where you can see the different kinds of ends being generated. For example, when eco R1 digest its uh, sequence, the type of ends that is that it creates its sticky, but uh, eco R5 uh, generates a blunt end digestion. So, he in the sticky end one strand is longer than the other usually by a few nucleotides and we, we have overhangs over here, but in the 
blunt and digestion both the strengths are equal and there is blunt which means they end in the same base position leaving no unpaired basis on either strands. Now, we to discuss about uh, isocesomers, neocesomers and isocolomers with respect to the digestion patterns. So, what are isocesomers? So, here are two restriction uh, uh, enzymes and their recognition sites SPH1 and BBU1. If you look keenly into the two recognition si uh, sequences over here, they are same CGTACG for both the restriction enzymes. Such recognition enzymes which recognize and cleave at the identical recognition sites are called as isocesomers. The first discovered enzyme that recognizes a given sequence is known as the prototype, while all subsequently discovered enzymes that recognize identical sequences are called as isocesomers. So, we may have many different kind of enzymes which identifies the same sequence. The first one will be the prototype and the other following members discovered later will be called as isocesomers of the prototype. Now, there is another uh, concept called uh, neocesomers. These are the restriction enzymes which recognize the same site and have a different cleavage pattern. So, here you can have two examples of SMA1 and XMA1 and they are the neocesomers of each other and here you have Ti1 and Mai2 which are uh, neocesomers of one another. What are isocolomers? These are restriction enzymes that recognize slightly different sequences but upon cleavage produce the same ends. This is little bit different from the earlier two cases. So, you have two examples here MBO1 and BAMH1 and you can see that the recognition sequences are different at the ends. The central sequence ZATC is same, this is same, but the terminal sequences N can be any of the bases are different. But when they will be cleaving, this is the cleavage point you can see over here. So, they generate the same sequence. So, that these kind of enzyme pairs are known as isocodomers. These isocodomers permit fragments generated with one enzyme to ligate with fragments generated through another. It can be utilized to eliminate restriction sites from the resulting fragments. So, we now know a lot about enzymes uh, which digest DNA and which generates either sticky ends or blunt ends. Now, let us learn about enzymes which do the opposite operation that is instead of cutting they join DNA fragments. Such enzymes are known as ligases or DNA ligases. So, they are the enzymes responsible for DNA joining and was discovered independently and near, near, nearly concurrently by uh, five different uh, persons working in five different laboratories in 1967. In 1968, Okajaki et al discovered another function of the DNA ligase. DNA in the legging strand replicates discontinuously and the short fragments generated by this process are joined into continuous strands with the help of a DNA ligase. The gene coding T for DNA ligase was cloned by Wilson and Murray in 1979. The primary structure and genetic organization of the T for DNA ligase was found by Armstrong et al in 1983. So, as already discussed DNA joins DNA ligase joins DNA fragments. So, it basically catalyzes the formation of a phosphodiester bone at a single strand break and it requires free hydroxyl group at the 3 prime end of one DNA chain and a phosphate group at the 5 prime end of the other and requires energy in the process. E. coli and other bacterial DNA ligases utilize NAD plus as energy donor 
Whereas T4 bacterial phase DNA ligase uses ATP as a cofactor. So, here you can see the role of DNA ligase at the step where you want to join the DNA fragments into a cloning vectors before we transform the bacterial cells with the vectors loaded with target DNA. Another enzyme which is important for genetic engineering is PNK or polynucleotide kinase. So, it was discovered by Richardson and Harwich in Escherichia coli in 1965, uh, uh, which was uh, infected by T4 and uh, T2 bacteriophage. Whenever there is a strand break, the ends must be converted into 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl termini in order to allow DNA polymerases and ligases to catalyze repair synthesis and strand rejoining. PNK is the key enzyme involved in this end processing. So, there are various sources of PNK. For example, you have a mouse PNK and uh, they have some conserved structures. There is a fork associated domain which directs the PNK to the site of DNA damage. PNK has to find out the position in the DNA which needs to be repaired and fork head associated domain helps PNK in doing this. How the DNA strand is processed at the termini by a PNK? So, PNK catalyzes the phosphorylation of 5 prime hydroxyl termini and uh, dephosphorylation of the 3 prime phosphate termini so that subsequent nucleotide insertion and strain rejoining can be mediated by DNA polymerases and ligases respectively. Another application of PNK is in the labeling the ends of DNA or RNA with radioactive phosphate group and uh, this is highly helpful in DNA autoradiography experiments. The next enzyme which is important in the process of recombinant DNA technology is alkaline phosphatase which was discovered by Robert Robinson in London in 1923. Alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme found in all body tissues and some tissues contain very high amounts of this enzyme like the liver, bile ducts and bone. This enzyme is highly useful in the process of genetic engineering. It is a homodimeric enzyme which catalyzes reactions like hydrolysis and transphosphorylation of phosphate monoester. It removes phosphate groups from the 5 prime ends of DNA leaving a 5 prime hydroxyl group and is used to prevent unwanted ligation of DNA molecules. During post translational modification, alkaline phosphatase is modified by N glycosylation. It undergoes a modification through which uptake of two zinc ions and one magnesium ions occur, which is important in forming active site of that enzyme. Alkaline phosphatase are isolated from various sources and tissues, and you can see the reaction over here how the DNA fragment with 5 prime phosphate. Uh, under the catalytic activity of alkaline phosphatase become free of the uh, phosphate groups at the uh, DNA ends. As already told you there are several sources of alkaline phosphatase and uh, they are used for uh, genetic manipulation. Uh, we have bacterial alkaline phosphatases, calf intestinal alkaline uh, phosphatases. As the name indicates they are isolated from the respective organisms. BAP is a phosphomonoester and it hydrolyzes 3 prime and 5 prime phosphate from nucleic acid. It is more uh, suitable for removing phosphate group before and, and leveling and remove phosphate from vector prior to insert ligation. BAP generally shows optimum activity at 65 degree centigrade. It is sensitive to inorganic phosphate, so in presence of inorganic phosphates, the activity may be reduced. The calf intestinal alkaline phosphatase is isolated from calf intestine uh, 
catalyzes the removal of the phosphate group from the 5 prime end of the DNA as well as RNA. This enzyme is highly used in gene cloning experiments uh, to make construct that could not undergo self ligation. Hence, after the treatment with CIP without having a phosphate group at 5 prime ends, a vector cannot self ligate and recircularize. This step improves the efficiency of the vector containing the desired insert. There is another source from shrimp and we call it shrimp alkaline phosphatase. This is a highly specific heat level phosphatase enzyme and this is isolated from the arctic shrimp. It removes 5 prime phosphate group from DNA, RNA, DNTPs and proteins. SAF has similar specific activity as SIP but unlike CIP uh, as a CIP but unlike CIP it can be irreversibly inactivated by heat treatment at 65 degree centigrade for 15 minutes. SAP is used for 5 prime dephosphorylation during cloning experiments for various applications as follows. Uh, it dephosphorylate 5 prime phosphate groups of DNA RNA for subsequent leveling of the ends. It is used to prevent self ligation of the linearized plasmid and to prepare PCR products for sequencing to activate remaining DNTPs from PCR products. How alkaline phosphatase help in the DNA modification is more or less now known to you. Uh, it is used for removing the 5 prime phosphate from different vectors like plasmids, bacteriophages after treating with restriction enzymes. This treatment will prevent the vectors from self ligation because of the unavailability of phosphate group at the end. So, this treatment enhances the ligation of the desired uh, insert. During ligation of desired insert, the complementary ends of the insert and the vector will come to proximity to each other. One strand of the insert having 5 prime phosphate will ligate with the 3 prime OH of the vector and the remaining strand will have a nick. This nick will be sealed in the next step by ligase enzyme in the presence of ATP. It is used to remove 5 prime phosphate from fragment of DNA prior to leveling with radioactive uh, phosphates. Let us now move on to the uh, next section in this lecture, the a discussion on vectors. What is a vector? As defined by NHGRI, a vector with respect to molecular biology is a DNA molecule which may be often a plasmid or virus that is used as a vehicle to carry a particular DNA segment into a host cell as part of a cloning or recombinant DNA technique. The vector typically assists in replicating and or expressing inserted DNA sequence inside the host cell. There are various kinds of vectors. Let us start the discussion with plasmids and look into the basic features of plasmid vectors and important concepts like size and copy number and different types of vectors like cloning and expression vector. So this term plasmid was proposed by Joshua Lederberg as a generic term for any extra chromosomal hereditary determinant. It is a hybrid word of plasm coming from cytoplasm and ID which is a Latin word for it which together make the word plasmid which is basically a small circular extra chromosomal DNA molecule found in bacteria and microscopic organism. This is called extra chromosomal DNA because the DNA has a main bacterial chromosome and anything which is in addition to that are called as the plasmid DNA. Now, with every cell replication you can see over here both the bacterial DNA and the plasmid DNA are replicated. So, in many cases the replication of the plasmid may be independent of the replication of the bacterial DNA and sometimes they may be connected to each other. The rate of bacterial main chromosome replication may govern the rate of plasmid DNA uh, replication that we will discuss later. In certain cases, the plasmid may get integrated into the uh, main chromosome and in this case, the rate of replication obviously will be the same because now the plasmid DNA has become an integral part of the main chromosomal DNA. Now we know that bacteria is a very hardy organism. It can survive in very difficult environment uh, such as 
highly toxic amounts of antibiotics. All these fitness characters are due to certain genes present in the extra chromosomal DNA called as uh, plasmids. These antibiotic resistance trait is a boon for the recombinant DNA technology discipline. Here it is employed as a selectable marker to confirm the bacteria in a culture to carry out a specific plasmid. Now what are stringent and uh, relaxed plasmid? So I just discussed about the relation between the main bacterial plasmid and the extra chromosomal uh, bacterial uh, plasmid DNA uh, with respect to their uh, replication. A plasmid that replicates along with the main chromosome of the bacteria and is present as a single or low copy number as per cell are known as a stringent plasmid. plasmid. While relaxed plasmids can replicate independently of the main bacterial chromosome and is present in 10 to 5000 copies uh, per cell. So, here you can see uh, the two different cases here uh, the plasmid number and the main chromosome number is remaining constant, but in this case the number in the case of relaxed plasmid the number will be more because the main chromosomal replication cannot govern the number of the uh, plasmid DNA. So, that those are natural plasmids that we are discussing. Now, we cannot carry out recombinant DNA technology work with the help of natural plasmids because certain features are missing in, missing in those plasmids. So, for our work we have to develop the tools, develop the vector in such a way that they become amenable to the various demands of these uh, technique. For these artificial plasmids were created and there are several limitations uh, which are overtaken by these artificial plasmids over the natural plasmids. For example, artificial pla uh, natural plasmids may be having low copy number, they may have narrow host range and are stringent nature then they have poor marker genes and their size may be very large. So, a large size vector will not be suitable uh, for cloning because with the insertion of the gene of interest it will become much larger and then delivery of this vector into the host will become a challenge. So, smaller vectors having higher loading capacity are the most desirable for gene transfer into the host. Now, let us go by one by one uh, what are the special things and features that we require in a, in a plasmid vector. Artificial plasmids are constructed to overcome these limitations by com combining useful elements from different sources. We may not be finding the features in a single place. So, we bring in all the suitable features from different plasmids and then we combine them into one single uh, vector. The artificial vectors can be divided into two main categories the cloning vector and the expression vector and here are some of the artificial plasmid vectors PBR322 or PUC19. The number of copies where certain plasmid in the cell is referred to as the plasmid copy number which is already discussed in a way. The plasmids may be either low, medium or high copy number plasmids. Mutated plasmids that replicate to a high copy number are used in many biotechnological applications. If we want to do cloning, if we have a high copy number vector that is much more advantageous than a low copy number uh, vector. In 1973, a small group of scientists uh, comprising of Stanley Falco, Stanley Cohen, Herbert Boyer and Charles Brinton worked out an unusual idea of using a tetracycline resistant plasmid PSC101 and a newly developed kanamycin resistant plasmid PSC102 to develop E. coli transformance resistance to both tetracycline and kanamycin 
utilizing a newly discovered eco R1 enzyme which is a restriction enzyme and you already know the uh, recognition site of this particular enzyme and they become successful in doing so and they created history by creating the first plasmid cloning vector which revolutionized uh, molecular biology. So, as I told you earlier we combine desirable features uh, picking them up from various other sources. So, in this case this particular team picked up the tetracycline resistance sequence and the kanamycin resistance sequence and joined them into one single vector to create this vector with a hybrid uh, character having resistance to both the antibiotics. Let us discuss in brief the characteristics of an ideal plasmid vector. A plasmid we are telling should be ideally uh, vector should be ideally of high copy number. Now, for replication of this particular vector we always need a replication origin without which the plasmid cannot replicate. So, our one of the desired characters of a plasmid vector that it should contain an origin of rep replication or oricide. In the earlier case we discussed how two different antibiotic marker sequences were joined into one single vector. So, another desirable character is that there should be presence of selective markers such as antibiotic resistant genes. Plasmids should be vectors particularly should be smaller in size. Uh, the large size plasmids are not suitable to be vectors due to challenges involved in their delivery. Now, for cloning the desired targeted DNA sequence or gene we knew they need a cloning site. A single uh, enzyme specific cloning site is not ideal because that limits the choice of the cutting ends generated. So, we need a multiple cloning site which can be digested by different kind of enzymes. And the most important thing is that these plasmid vectors should be easily isolated from the host cell. What are multiple cloning sites? The multiple cloning sites or MCS or polylinker sequence is a synthetic DNA segment with a cluster of restriction enzyme specific sites. It is introduced into a gene cloning vector to increase the number of number and types of cut ends as already I have discussed to you. And you can see here the various features of these uh, plasmid vector which is having a marker gene. Then you have these MCS over here multiple cloning site. And for example, if you focus on this multiple cloning site, you have three over here and you can see here uh, it is having uh, more multiple uh, uh, cloning sites. So, for example, to increase the multiple cloning sites, so this particular plas plasmid was digested with eco R1 and then uh, and, and as well as uh, SAL1. So, that removes a fragment uh, in between these two sequences. Now, we have another sequence here which has recognition sites for three additional uh, restriction enzymes. Now, when we ligate these into this gap, we get a new plasmid with more number of multiple cloning sites. And you may notice here the origin of replication and the antibiotic resistance gene. So, uh, through this discussion, you can now uh, understand how we can increase the number of cloning sites in a particular uh, site by the process of cloning uh, itself. So, let us now move on to discuss the two type of vectors. One is the cloning vector and the other is the expression vector. They have many of the features which are common to uh, both of them, but expression vector would have something additional. So, let us start with the cloning vectors. So, they are short pieces of DNA that can be used to introduce a foreign gene of interest into a host cell. They can be stably maintained 
inside the host cell generally used to obtain multiple copies of a target gene and it contains origins of replication selectable marker and a restriction site or a multiple cloning site. And you have various examples for cloning vectors like plasmid, cosmid, back, yak and fuzzes. Expression vectors are a type of vector which not only introduces gene of interest into the host cell but also aids in the expression of the cell of gene of interest. So, here the gene will be finally translated into its a protein product because you have the elements of transcription as well as translation uh, incorporated into the gene construct. So, it contains promoter, enhancer, start stop codon besides the selectable markers then origin of replication and the restriction uh, cloning site. So, these promoter enhancer start stop codon are not available in a cloning vector because their purpose is not for expression of the uh, gene construct into its protein product and therefore, it is unnecessary to have those elements over there. The sole purpose of a cloning vector is to increase the number of the uh, gene construct in very, very high amounts. So, example of expression vectors are PGX series of vectors. Let us discuss about the subtle vectors. What are subtle vectors? Subtle vectors are the vectors which can be propagated in two or three different host species both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Therefore, inserted DNA can be manipulated and replicated into different cellular systems. The East subtle vector is the most used subtle vector. They have components that allow for replication and restriction selection in both E. coli cells and East cells. The E. coli component contains an origin of replication and a selectable marker, example antibiotic resistance, etc. The yeast component of the yeast subtle vector includes an autonomously replicating uh, sequence, a yeast centromere and a yeast selectable marker. Let us go to the bacteriophages which are ubiquitous and diverse range of viruses that infect and replicate only inside bacterial cells. All bacteriophages consist of a nucleic acid genome encased inside a fuzz encoded capsid protein that protects the genetic material and mediates its delivery into the next host cell. Bacteriophages are strictly species specific for their host and infect a single bacterial species or specific strains. They have two replication strategies, one is the lytic cycle, another is the lysogenic cycle. Two types of bacteriophages are used for cloning, the lambda back phase and the M13 phase. Both lambda phase and M13 bacteriophages can infect E. coli. The lambda phase contains a double stranded linear DNA genome while the M13 contains a single stranded uh, filamentous uh, DNA. There are certain advantages of using fast vector over plasmid vector. Uh, the fast vectors can hold larger inserts allowing the cloning of large eukaryotic genes and their regulatory elements. To allow large sized foreign DNA to be inserted into fast DNA some non-essential genes from the fast vector are deleted. Example, the genes for lysogeny from lambda fuzz, since using it as a cloning vector requires only the lytic cycle. Insertion vectors and replacement vectors are the two type of fuzz vectors which are available and we will have a discussion on them later. These insertion vectors can carry DNA with a size of 5 to 11 kb and can be introduced into a specific cleavage site. The replacement vectors uh, can carry DNA which are quite bigger and range from 8 to 24, uh, kilo base, uh, 24 kilo bases. So, you can see here the diagram of an uh, insertion vector and the size of this vector as can be depicted between these uh, uh, lines say for example, they are ranging from here to here. Now, it has a specific restriction site and then there are two cost sites on the two ends. Now, when this restriction digestion takes place, uh, it clips the vector into two parts and then uh, if we have a DNA insert with a similar complementary end, it can be inserted into this uh, with the help of ligase molecule. But uh, once we do the 
insertion of these generic uh, sequence, the size of the recombinant vector along with the uh, insert will increase because with the addition of the generic sequence, the size will be uh, added up. Now, we have other kinds of vectors which are known as uh, replacement vectors. So, here uh, we have two restriction sites and upon restriction digestion, the stuffer sequence which lies in between do, these two restriction sites are released. And uh, into these uh, sequence or gap, we can easily add our gene of interest and this will not add up to the additional length of the uh, DNA uh, recombinant DNA vector sequence. So, therefore, uh, we can uh, load bigger sizes of DNA into the uh, replacement vectors. Then we have other kinds of vectors like the phasmid vectors. A phasmid is also known uh, as a phasmid and it is a DNA based cloning vector that possesses both bacteriophage and plasmid characteristics. It can be used for cloning, sequencing and gene expression. It contains both plasmid and bacteriophage origin of replication. This is a ma map of a phasmid vector P mod 1 which has been uh, constructed for single chain variable fragment fuzz display uh, library. So, the here you can see the transcription is under the control of a LEC uh, promoter. Then there have the ampicillin uh, resistant uh, gene uh, for the selection of the phasmid. This phasmid carries F1 and call E1 uh, origins of replication for application in FAS and E. coli uh, respectively. The secretion of the SCF5FB fragment is directed by this particular gene called uh, gene 3 signal peptide. The SCFB genes are cloned between uh, SFIL and uh, no, this one the SFI1 and the uh, uh, NOT1 and in between uh, we uh, clone the SCFB uh, sequences. So, there is an amber stop codon in the frame uh, here, amber stop codon frame uh, over here. So, these various features make these uh, vector very, very special and altogether different from the other kinds of vectors that we have uh, discussed uh, till now. Let us now discuss about some other kinds of vectors, the yeast artificial chromosome. Uh, the basic strategy for developing yeast artificial chromosomes was described originally in 1983 by Murray and uh, Jostak. In 1987, Burke and his co-workers demonstrated that yeast artificial chromosomes can be used for cloning very large segments of exogenous DNA. Yaks are frequently utilized in the mapping and sequencing of genomes. They can hold segments of an organism's DNA that are up to 1 million base pairs long. The yaks are then transformed into yeast cells with their inserted DNA. The yak DNA is amplified as the yeast cells grow and divide and it may be extracted and used for DNA mapping and sequencing. However, it has few disadvantages like less stability and low cloning efficiency. Also deletions, rearrangements and non-contiguous bits of clone DNA are common in yak clones. A typical yak series vector consists of two telomere repeat sequences that originate from tetrahymena and are separated by a BAM H1 stuffer fragment which is cleaved from the vector prior to ligation. The cloning site is flanked by two arms each of which contain a selectable marker in yeast and one of the telomere sequences. One arm contains TRP1 as a yeast selectable marker, the sequence for replication in yeast and an S cerevisiae centromere as well as the origin of replication for E. coli and an ampicillin resistance marker for selection during the preparation of the vector. The other arm contains the URA3 selectable marker in yeast. The cloning site is within the SUP4 gene which if introduced intact into AB1380 
suppresses a mutation of the ad2 locus the host resulting in the host resulting in a color change from red to white in the presence of limiting concentrations of adenine this provides a convenient phenotypic selection for recombinants if interruption for the sop4 gene occurs recombinants will grow red and recomb non recombinants with an intact suppressor will uh, grow white in the same way we have other kind of artificial chromosomes known as bacterial artificial chromosome a bacterial artificial chromosome is a dna molecule which has been created to clone dna sequences in bacteria bacs are frequently used for dna sequencing they can include segments of an organism's dna ranging in the size from 100000 to 300000 base pairs the bac dna is amplified when the transformed bacterial cells grow and divide the various gene components in a bac are the rap e which is replication and which replicate and control the copy number then par a and par b which maintain stability and divides f plasmid dna to daughter cells during division then the selectable markers for antibiotic resistance gene or lexz then t7 and sp6 fast promoters we have a natural genetic engineer uh, which is the agrobacterium these agrobacterium species like agrobacterium tumefaciens and agrobacterium rhizogens infect plants and cause crown gall and hairy root diseases in this process the tumor inducing ti and the root inducing plasmids play a major role these agrobacterium species can transfer a part of the ti or ri plasmid called the transfer dna or t dna to the host plant cells in the application of these particular plasmids uh, we reengineer these uh, plasmids by removing their pathogenic sequences and only retaining the sequences which are useful for mobilizing the uh, insert dna into the host plant so with this we come to the end of of this discussion this is briefly a, a timeline of the development of the uh, gmo uh, starting in 1922 when the first hybrid corn was produced and uh, sold uh, commercially in 19 82 the fda approves the first consumer genetically modified organism which is the human insulin for diabetes treatment and the coordinated framework for the biotechnology regulation was established by the federal government to ensure the safety of genetically modified organism in 1986 in 1984 the first gmo was developed through genetic engineering a gmo tomato and it became available for sale after safety evaluation by federal agencies in 205 gmo alfalfa and sugar beets were released for sale in the uh, united states thank you mm -hmm.